Good morning, everyone. This is the pre-launch news conference for CRS-7 with our partners Orbital ATK and United Launch Alliance, as well as our space science participant from the Johnson Space Center in Houston to discuss some about the upcoming CRS-7 mission. First on the panel will be Joel Montalbano, our deputy manager for the NASA International Space Station program from JSC in Houston. Vern Thorpe, the program manager for commercial missions from United Launch Alliance. Frank Culberson, the space systems group president from Orbital ATK. Tara Rutley, the Associate Program Scientist for the International Space Station Program. And David Kraft, the Launch Weather Officer from the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron. And we'll begin first with opening comments from Joel Top uh, Montalbano from the NASA International Space Station Program Office. Joel? Well, good morning and welcome again to the pre-launch press conference. It's uh, once again exciting to be down here at Kennedy Space Center on the eve of another commercial cargo resupply mission. I want to thank our ULA and, and orbital colleagues for preparing vehicle, uh, the vehicles and, and get us to where we are today. Uh, we're looking forward to a great mission. The Cygnus spacecraft will carry about 3,500 kilograms of equipment to the International Space Station. Highlights of that equipment, about 1,000 pounds of uh, utilization and the crew research about 1,000 pounds of, or 1,000 kilograms of uh, crew supplies and about 1,200 kilograms of vehicle hardware. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, a launch tomorrow uh, shortly after 11 o'clock uh, local Eastern time, 11.11, and then we'll have uh, a capture uh, Saturday morning uh, shortly after uh, 6 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, the reason for the long, longer rendezvous is to uh, clear the field for a Soyuz launch. We have a Soyuz launch out of Baikonur, Kazakhstan on April 20th. We'll have a uh, crew launching there. They'll do a, a four orbit rendezvous or uh, six hours from launch to docking. We'll have a day in between and then uh, we'll bring in the, the Cygnus vehicle. So uh, looking forward to a great mission. The, the vehicle's expected to stay uh, just over 80 days, 85 days I believe is the, the latest number. And so I uh, just wanna thank you for coming and uh, I'll hand it back over to you, George. All right, thank you, Joel. And now to Vern Thorpe, the program manager for commercial missions from the United Launch Alliance. Vern. Thanks, George. Good morning. I'm happy to be here today uh, with all of you, just over 24 hours ahead of our planned launch tomorrow. Uh, we're preparing an Atlas V 401 rocket to launch Orbital ATK's Cygnus spacecraft on the initial leg of its cargo resupply mission, bringing supplies, equipment, and science experiments to the International Space Station. OA-7 will be the seventh Cygnus flight and the third time that Cygnus has flown on board an Atlas V rocket. It's an honor to launch this spacecraft, which has been named in memory of John Glenn. I feel like we're bridging history. Uh, John Glenn flew on an Atlas rocket in 1962 when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. And right now, we are actually preparing Atlas to begin flying astronauts again uh, in the near future as part of NASA's commercial crew program. OA-7 will be ULA's 71st launch of the Atlas V rocket and the 36th of the 401 configuration. That 401 configuration has really become the Atlas V workhorse. Uh, that particular configuration has launched about half of our Atlas V missions over the years. This will be our fourth launch, ULA's fourth launch of 2017 and the 119th launch since ULA was formed in December of 2006. The Atlas 401 vehicle includes a four meter payload fairing, and many of you know that that payload fairing comes in three different lengths. We're using the longest version for this mission, known as the XCPF, that stands for extended or extra extended payload fairing. Um, Atlas V, uh, as usual, is uh, propelled by the uh, RD-180 engine on the back end, and the Centaur upper stage will use Aerojet Rocketdyne's RL-10C uh, rocket engine. And this configuration has enough performance capabilities so that we will not need any uh, solid rocket booster strap-ons. Uh, now I have a brief clip uh, showing some of the processing activities that have gotten us to this point. I'd like to roll that if we could. So here you see 
our ULA Mariner arriving at Port Canaveral. This happened on February 5th. Uh, we brought in both of our stages, the Atlas Booster Stage and the Suntar Upper Stage, and then we transported them a few miles uh, down the road to our Atlas Spacecraft Operations Center, also known as the ASOC. When we get the stages there, we do some uh, final checkout and some additional processing to get ready for launch. Uh, you can see the vehicle there in the high bay of the ASOC. And here we are out at the launch pad. Uh, we put the booster up on February 22nd. And uh, that was when we were targeting the original March launch date. Uh, the first thing we do when we go on stand with the vehicle is put the booster onto the mobile launch platform. And once it's secure, uh, typically the next day, we'll bring out the Centaur upper stage. And one thing that we've started doing uh, in the last couple of years is actually integrating that Centaur that you see there with the interstage adapter on the bottom and some of the other adapter structures on top. Uh, the, each of those used to be a separate step where we would made it out at the, um, at the VIF, our vertical integration facility, but now we can do all that at one of our other processing facilities and bring that integrated stack out. So putting up the vehicle is really uh, just a two-step operation. Once the vehicle is up, we'll bring the encapsulated spacecraft out. That's what you see here. Uh, that spacecraft transport and made operation occurred on March 17th, uh, a few weeks ago. And of course, once that's on top, you're about a week away from launch. We do some final integrated testing and checkout, and, uh, and then we're ready for our final reviews, and we're ready to go. And that leads us to the next video that I'd like to show you. This is a, a video showing the flight sequence that you can expect to see tomorrow. Can we roll that? Five, four, three. We have Atlas Ignition. Two, one, zero, and liftoff. We have liftoff of the Atlas V rocket. So Atlas V will lift off under the power of that RD-180 engine that I mentioned. That's actually a, it's a single engine with two thrust chambers, and it puts out a little less than 900,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff. That's enough to accelerate the vehicle to Mach 1 in about 83 seconds. Uh, we'll hit maximum dynamic pressure at about 94 seconds. And then that will continue to burn for a little over four minutes, about four minutes and 15 seconds. At that point, uh, we'll be out of fuel, we'll shut down the engine, the vehicle will be traveling about 10,000 miles an hour, and we will separate the uh, Centaur upper stage with the payload attached. And then 10, ten seconds after that separation, we'll light the engines after we do some, uh, some engine conditioning to get ready for that. That first engine burn will last about 13 minutes and 21 seconds. A few seconds into that, we'll separate the payload fairing as you saw right there. And that single burn will put the Cygnus spacecraft into the orbit that uh, we need to get it to. Uh, we'll coast for a little less than three minutes, about two minutes and 49 seconds, orient to the proper separation attitude and separate the Cygnus. Uh, once that's done, we will actually do another coast with Centaur, uh, almost half an hour, and then we'll do a short burn, about a 12-second engine burn, and that burn is to do a controlled deorbit of the Centaur upper stage and the Centaur will come down uh, in the Arctic Ocean, a little south of Australia, just after an hour uh, after liftoff, about, a, I think, one hour and six minutes, they're predicting, uh, is when that reentry will take place. So uh, this morning, just to give you the final update, we did roll to the launch pad out at Complex 41 on our mobile launch platform. Uh, final connections and some final checkouts are in work as we speak right now and we'll load RP-1 propellant onto the booster a little bit later today. After that operation is complete, we'll secure the vehicle. Uh, this afternoon, we have one more re major review, and that's the final launch readiness review with the Air Force's 45th Space Wing. And after that, we'll uh, let our crew get some rest, and very early tomorrow morning, some of our folks uh, on the various teams will start coming in to uh, pick up the countdown. And as was mentioned earlier, we're targeting about an 11, 11 a.m. local time. That could actually shift a little bit because what we do for this mission is we actually uh, update the trajectory if needed about 24 hours in advance to account for any last minute changes to the space station orbit. Uh, we have that flexibility to really tailor the trajectory right down to the last minute. Um, 
so with that, I'd like to I'd like to thank all of our partners. Uh, you know, as always, it takes an incredible team effort to to get to this point. I'd like to thank the Air Force, the FAA, our customer Orbital ATK, all of our uh, suppliers who've worked with us. As always, we're relentlessly focused on mission success, and we're looking forward to a great launch tomorrow and continuing our record of 100% mission success. So thank you. Back to you, George. Thank you, Vern. And now to Frank Culbertson, the Space Systems Group President from Orbital ATK. Frank. Thank you very much, George, and uh, good morning to everyone. On behalf of uh, David Thompson and the entire Orbital ATK team, I'd like to thank you for the hospitality. Uh, it's great to be back here at the Kennedy Space Center Cape Canaveral uh, Complex. Uh, we've had great service and great collaboration with the folks here at uh, KSC in preparing our payload and our spacecraft. And, of course, our partners, ULA, have done a great job getting us ready for flight. They've worked through a few issues that have uh, delayed the original plan for the launch, but we're still on track for delivering to the um, space station and flying the uh, SS John Glenn. Uh, we are very proud of that fact that uh, this spacecraft is named after um, my former uh, fellow astronaut John Glenn, a real pioneer, of course, in the space world, and as Vern said, who launched for the first time out of here on an Atlas rocket. So I think the, almost 55 years ago, uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, great tribute to John to be able to, to uh, take his name to orbit once again. Um, we do have a, sh a short video that I'd like to play, if we could start rolling the video to show our processing uh, sequence here. This is the uh, service module arriving at Kennedy Space Center a couple of months ago. Uh, we're preparing it to mate it with the pressurized cargo module, um, which arrived separately. It's being uncrated in this, uh, in this scene. Um, it came from... Uh, Torino, Italy, uh, manufactured by uh, Talas Alenia, uh, some really great partners in building modules for space and for the International Space Station. Here they're being mated so that we could begin to do, uh, load the cargo, and, uh, uh, and of course we'll host a number of science experiments. It's a fairly complex process. A lot of, uh, a lot of bolts have to be tightened and, and uh, a lot of things put in place. But here you see it being moved from the... Uh, uh, processing facility uh, over to the PHSF um, where we'll do final loading. And of course it's shrouded to protect it from, uh, from the weather in this, uh, in this scene. And here we are beginning the uh, cargo load including the uh, powered mid-deck lockers that we're carrying to the space station. Uh, we are carrying more this time than we have in the past and uh, that's a, a good step forward for us and for the crew. The more research we can carry, the more they can do their job, and the more they can show the utility of the uh, International Space Station. A nice shot of uh, John there in that previous previous uh, scene. Uh, after it's loaded, we take it to the VIF, as uh, Vern mentioned, for uh, installation on top of the rocket. Uh, sort of a uh, breathtaking event in itself, but uh, still one that they've done many times and one that we have a lot of confidence in. Um, this scene is uh, what you will see when the uh, Cygnus detaches from the uh, Atlas upper stage. And then we'll uh, deploy the solar arrays, which of course are built by another orbital ATK component uh, in uh, Goleta, California. Uh, these are our UltraFlex arrays that have done a fantastic job for us on this spacecraft and on others. Once we berth with the uh, International Space Station after our uh, approach and rendezvous, um, of course, the crew that will first grapple the, sta the uh, Cygnus spacecraft with the uh, Canadian robotic arm and then attaches to, the, um, to Node 1, Unity Node, in preparation for unloading. The um, crew, of course, is always very anxious to see what w comes up in the Cygnus spacecraft. Um, this is from a previous one, of course, but uh, uh, we do think they'll be excited. Um, we are sorry we missed Easter but we're pretty sure they'll be excited about their Easter baskets or whatever <laughs> great things uh, International Space Station Science put on forward for them. More experience experiments for them to, to take part in, I'm sure. Once we finish our mission at the station and we uh, uh, load the um, discarded cargo, we will also conduct a couple of more experiments, including a uh, uh, combustion experiment on behalf of Glenn Research Center, deploy some uh, CubeSats and, uh, for planets, uh, uh, for nano racks, and then uh, of course there'll be an experiment to uh, evaluate the reentry of the Cygnus itself, which uh, we've done on previous missions. 
And, of course, everything will burn up as it reenters the atmosphere. Right, Frank? Okay, good. Um, but like I said, we may be a little bit late, but we're happy to, to be coming uh, Easter week and, and uh, to see the, uh, the excitement on the face of the astronauts. And there will be additional crew on board. I'd like to uh, wish my colleagues, uh, Fyodor, your chicken, and Jack Fisher, or Z-Fish, uh, bon voyage and, um, and good luck on their flight on a Soyuz in two days. And uh, they'll be arriving just before we do. And uh, we look forward to, to the look on their faces as they, as they open the hatch and wish them well for their upcoming mission on the International Space Station. Uh, as I said, we're happy to be back here, happy to be flying again, and uh, looking forward to many more flights in the future. But this is the one we're focused on today. Everything looks great. And again, we appreciate the, uh, the great work by all of our partners, including, as Vern said, the FAA and NASA, who've helped, uh, helped us get ready for this mission. Um, and as I hand it back to George, I would like to also thank George for his 37 years of service in this job and uh, all the many interviews and, and um, uh, conferences like press conferences he's done like this and all that he's put up with in having to deal with some of us that have flown in space and trying to explain what the heck is he doing now. But, uh, but George has done a terrific job of that, uh, a real true fan of the space program but also uh, a real contributor. And uh, we do appreciate all of these done, and, and I'm pretty sure he won't go very far away. So George, thank you for everything. Thank you, it's a lot of fun. Sure has beat working for 11. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, next uh, to Tara Rutley, the Associate Program Scientist for the International Space Station. Tara? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Frank, I share the sentiment that it's really great to be back at KSC. Watch the buzz about all the science that's getting ready to launch to station. I uh, got to talk to a couple of scientists this morning, and they're ready to go, excited to be here. Um, we have some a wide range of, of, of support uh, equipment that's going to be headed to station to support the science that's up there already, but also to introduce some brand new capabilities and some exciting new research uh, to station. I'm going to share some of those examples with you today, but I could be here for over an hour myself. So in the interest of time, I want to make sure that you all are aware of our website where you can go and learn a lot about many more of the investigations for station, and that's www.nasa.gov forward slash ISS dash science. So ISS dash science, that's where all the science information can be found. So uh, the first parts I want to share with you uh, that's pretty exciting, and, and it's real exciting to see Space Station keep up with the advancements in technology on Earth. Um, we, it, is an, it is a laboratory. We want to invite the best and the brightest, the most capable scientists to use that platform. And so uh, the most interesting thing I think that's happening right now in terms of evolving science on station is all of the studies that are happening uh, basically looking at our health at levels that you can't even see. So these are levels at the very tiniest cell and molecular biological levels. So um, one of those examples is a payload that is um, actually being uh, developed or was a winning student proposal, a high school student proposal. This one's called Gene in Space 2. And now this student's proposal suggested to take a look at telomere length uh, and how spaceflight affects telomere length. Now telomeres are little end caps on the end of our chromosomes and our DNA, and every, as we get older with every cell division, they get shorter. And it's associated with aging, and it's associated with um, also stressful environments, um, and it has impacts uh, on our health. So this student proposed to uh, take a look at telomere uh, length and how spaceflight affects that by amplifying the DNA associated with the telomere uh, sections. Now amplification of DNA is a big deal if you want to go and study more about what's happening you know, as, as we see it in, in health. Uh, we actually were able to, for the first time ever in space, amplify DNA last uh, last year, I believe it was last summer, again, another high school student proposal from the same program, Genes in Space. Amplification of DNA is an important first step in then being able to sequence it and tell us what's happening in real, really. So, uh, so we'll be able to uh, see how this amplification process goes, get the data back, and maybe understand some of what uh, might be happening with telomeres in space. Um, now, uh, part of that also, Genes in Space 3 will happen later, a little bit later on, and we're going to be able to take the process, which is what scientists really do in the laboratory, 
like I said, where you start with amplification of DNA, then you want to be able to sequence DNA and tell you what you're actually looking at. What kind of a protein are you looking at? So that's what's going to happen next um, in genes in space three. We're going to combine two powerful uh, DNA capabilities, analytic capabilities in space, and for the first time ever, take them from amplification to what are we looking at. Um, and that's combining what we call the mini PCR with the biomolecule sequencer. That's a MinION product. Both are commercial uh, products, and uh, we're able to uh, take things end to end. So inviting again more molecular biology uh, studies on in space, looking at lots of things that could be uh, different in space flight. We also are uh, this this particular launch is also um, enabling an investigation that is looking at. Um, uh, contributing to fighting cancer, um, using the microgravity environment to, to uh, potentially fight cancer. Uh, this is a company called Oncolinks. They are working on what's called antibody drug conjugates, and they're developing them on the ground. It's basically where you take, um, you combine an antibody with a drug and be able to target directly the cancer cells themselves to, to fight cancer. Now, this group is particularly interested in um, using the microgravity environment to test their uh, process because uh, in space you can, uh, if you're really good at culturing, you can get some three-dimensional spherical uh, cells developed, cell cultures, in a way that's similar to what they see um, in the body. So this group is going to leverage the microgravity environment to, um, to test their drug efficacy and just contribute more data to what they're already developing um, on Earth. Uh, you can see that it obviously could have um, uh, Earth-based therapeutic um, benefits for those of us on the ground. But to be able to do studies like that, you need to be able to grow really good cell cultures. And so the next investigation that is enabled by this particular launch is called magnetic 3D cell culturing. So this particular investigation will use uh, magnetic cells um, that will be uh, obviously levitated in microgravity, but used to control cells hold them still if you think about it um, when you need to because growing cell cultures are, is very complicated on earth to do it in space is even more complicated because you have to feed them you have to change the media you have to keep the cells healthy and that could be tricky in space so this team is proposing to use magnets to basically hold your culture still while you do all those things to maintain cell cultures now what comes out of this could be very interesting in terms of new capabilities for all the different types of cells that we could potentially grow in space as we get more and more um, complex and we head towards more sophisticated studies. Um, they, this team is already doing these kind of uh, manipulations on the ground and have seen really interesting results uh, as well. So now they're ready to use our laboratory in space to further their progress and further ours. Now on the technology front, we have a new advanced plant habitat that's going up <clears throat> as well. Now this will be the, the largest ever uh, food production, plant production uh, capability uh, on the International Space Station. It's very um, complex in its systems. It's very capable, more capable than ever in the environment that the plants can grow in. It's got something like over 180 different sensors that will um, treat the plants the way they want to be treated so that they can grow um, food eventually uh, for our, our astronauts as we plan to ex uh, explore longer and beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, let's see, this. what they're sending up on this particular flight is the structure and uh, something called a uh, science carrier. And this science carrier will have a couple different seed types in them. It will have uh, dwarf wheat, I believe, and Arabidopsis. Now, wheat is a kind of a crop plant, right? Arabidopsis is a model organism plant that scientists can use. They know a lot about the genetics and a lot about how these plants can behave. So this first set of seeds uh, will be used as a demonstration of, of how we can wet these seeds and get germination of these seeds in microgravity in this new plant habitat where the environmental, uh, the environmental control is, can be precisely maintained exactly the way we want for studies. And then we have our first uh, peer-reviewed science study coming up in November that's going to use this plant habitat for um, hypothesis studies. So we want to make sure that we check out this, this, uh, this habitat and make sure it's in good use for that. We also have um, two investigations uh, that will be performed in what's called the SUBSA, which is a solidification furnace. Here is a furnace that was used early in space station era and was decommissioned and brought back to life recently. We've got two investigations that are going to perform what we call uh, crystallization melts, or basically growing crystals in, in forms of scintillators. 
And uh, if you know anything about growing crystals in space, this is a little bit different than what we would see with the traditional uh, diffusion-based. Uh, this is more of a furnace-based, a heat-based, where you can melt the, uh, melt the materials and regrow perfect crystals or near-perfect crystals in a way that uh, you can then study on Earth and reproduce that massively on the ground. What these scintillators do, one um, provides a color change when neutrons or gamma rays are detected, so it's kind of a radiation detector. The second one is a semiconductor type of material that could be used to uh, measure nuclear detection. So both of them, real implications on Earth, again, using the microgravity environment where it's, not, it's a, a, a calmer, um, less uh, conductive environment that would affect uh, crystal growth um, like it would on Earth. We also have um, the, nano, the Nanorax CubeSats deployment. And this, the, you heard a little bit about this earlier. And this is, to me, so fascinating because this didn't exist years ago. And now what we have is a capability to shoot off or deploy off these tiny little CubeSats from the International Space Station. And those CubeSats all serve a certain function as they circle around the Earth. They have sensors or, or taking photos. And in this case, there are 38 going up on the Cygnus. Um, and they include uh, customers such as the D Department of Defense, there are universities involved, NASA has its own that's gonna study ice in the clouds. Um, 28 of those are from a program called QB50. It's a European, European Union sponsored set of investigations. And th what that is, is a, is a constellation of universities around the world, over 15 countries spanning five continents, and each one of those um, satellites detecting and taking their own sensors of the thermosphere. Uh, and coming together as a constellation and, and integrating data over the next few years that tells us up, about our Earth's upper atmosphere. So it's a, a fascinating um, uh, set of uh, technology developments as we've seen grown. We've over, over 100, 150 of these CubeSats has been launched um, in the time of station. So uh, if you haven't ever seen any of those videos, you should definitely go take a look. It's really something to see uh, those tiny little CubeSats coming off of the space station. And uh, lastly, since we're uh, nearing the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about reentry. We've got a couple, three, three different pods um, that are that are part of the Red Data Two investigation that um, will uh, kind of let go, let loose of of the vehicle as as the uh, vehicles come in and on reentry. And their goal of these three pods is to test uh, new heat shield technologies for reentry uh, into the at atmosphere. One of those heat shield um, materials is a candidate for the Orion. Uh, that we're developing here at NASA. But the, the, the three pods will also take um, telemetry data, talk, looking at breakup conditions as well, and, and sending that information back to Earth to improve on future spacecraft reentry designs too. And with that, I want to say, again, there's much more that I can talk about, but if you tune in again at about 1 o'clock Eastern right here, uh, you will be able to hear from some of the scientists directly. We have something called What's On Board, and each scientist will take turns showing off their hardware, showing images, talking in a lot of detail about these investigations uh, that are headed to space station here, uh, hopefully tomorrow. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over. All right. Thank you, Tara. And now a snapshot of the weather for tomorrow morning. David Kraft, launch weather officer from the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron. David. Hello. Hey, thank you, George. I'm uh, Dave Kraft again, uh, U.S. Air Force meteorologist, one of the launch weather officers on this mission uh, from the 45th Space Wing. So what we are looking at, as mentioned earlier, uh, one of the activities that is going on today is MLP roll to pad, and, and as we do this briefing, it's, uh, pro uh, most of the activities are, are firming up at the pad, and we, are, we have a, a weather team that is actually monitoring uh, that operation, and everything is very favorable. Now, the meteorologist in me wants some really cool, severe weather to talk about during this briefing, but I'll ask, you're, you're, you're going to get the uh, kind of a down, a little decreased version of that uh, of that briefing. It's not going to be very exciting. Uh, but uh, again, uh, climatologically, this time of year is very generally very favorable for launch operations. And uh, it's no exception for this week. We're actually looking at very good weather today, very good weather for the primary day of launch, and also for the 24-hour backup day. Now, if I can shift your attention to the video, what you're seeing, I have it cycling through several images. What you're seeing now is the visible satellite imagery. It'll go to a radar imagery. That, here's your radar imagery. Now what you see on there is there's some green 
uh, echoes, radar uh, echoes offshore, kind of slowly tracking toward the land mass. That's going to be similar to what we see tomorrow. So some light, that green is rain showers. Now the infrared imagery, the color, the color uh, cloud, the colored enhanced clouds are deep convection. All that activity is well to the west, Texas, central U United States, frontal system as well to the north. The visual satellite imagery is what you're seeing there, the, the brighter white clouds just off the spaceport. That's, that'll be similar to tomorrow's what we'll see. We'll see a few isolated rain showers in the area. Some of those rain showers could grow to violate the cumulus cloud rule, but the, just the widely scattered nature of, of the activity, I'm not really expecting too much uh, uh, of a chance, and we'll get to the probabilities here. So getting to the forecast, So for the primary day, we're looking at easterly winds at 11 knots. Temperature range is going to be 75 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the concern would be the cumulus cloud rule. Basically, that is a standoff distances based on the height of the cloud, the cumulus clouds. It could be a standoff distance uh, of 10 nautical miles, 5 nautical miles. And then we have, uh, there is a portion of that rule flying through the cumulus cloud. That would be the concern for the primary day. But the probability of violating uh, the rule or any uh, violation for primary day is 10%. So we're looking at a very, so probability of violation is 10%, so looking at a very good, good chance to launch. If we do see some violation in the count, probably will be on the order of 15 to 20 minutes and the shower will pass through. So it should be very nice. So for the 24-hour delay forecast, very similar, although tropical moisture is, is trying to uh, creep into southern Florida on the, the backup day, but it should not affect us here in central Florida. So we should be looking at very similar conditions, maybe some uh, just very slightly stronger winds into the mid-teens uh, versus low teens for the primary day. And probability of violating is also, again, 10% uh, with the primary concern cumulus cloud rule. That pretty much concludes the weather portion of the briefing. Then uh, back to you, George. All right. Thank you, Dave. And we're ready now to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start here in the front with Bill. Bill Harwood, uh, CBS for Vern. Can you give us a little more detail on uh, the hydraulic hose issue and what happened to you guys that, that kind of got in the way of the launch in March and what you did to fix it? Yeah, we were, uh, I think the last time we talked, we were targeting a March 19th launch, <clears throat> and we had two hydraulic issues come up that we had to work through. One of them was on uh, some of our support uh, GSC, and the other one was on an engine component. So uh, actually replacing those components was, uh, it didn't take a lot of time. That's kind of the easy part. The harder part is doing a very, very thorough uh, anomaly investigation to make sure that you understand, you know, what happened to those components, why did they fail, and is there anything we need to do to make sure that it won't happen again. That took a little bit more time, but we did successfully get through that. Uh, I can't go into a lot of detail um, on uh, the engine components themselves because of the, the proprietary nature of that data. But uh, again, it was a, a GSC issue and a separate unrelated uh, issue on the, uh, the vehicle itself. So we had two back-to-back -back issues, actually three that we had to, to work through, all related to the hydraulic system. Uh, I understand, but I don't understand why it's proprietary if it, with the hydraulic system, just to give us some general idea of what the problem was. Why is that proprietary? I'm not asking for facts and figures. I'm just trying to understand what broke. I mean, my understanding was quick disconnect fittings or the bellows. And then oh, you had okay. some fatigue issues, and then can you at least explain some of that? Yeah, there was a, there, there was a, uh, a hydraulic line on the vehicle. It was a, a return line that uh, there was a small uh, section of it that developed a leak that we had to replace. And then uh, on the uh, ground side, um, I'm not an expert in exactly our, what our hydraulic GSE looks like, but there was uh, some sort of a, of a return mechanism on that that had to be replaced as well. Marsha? Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, probably Vern, but I'd like to hear more about the camera setup for launch for the 360 degree view uh, for uh, live on TV. Can you explain, you know, where's the camera? How's it going to work? How difficult was it to, to gear up like that? And how exciting is it to be able to, to do this? I don't have any details on that myself, but I think as soon as we're done here, I can I might be able to connect you with some other folks in the room who are familiar with that setup. 
Are you guys excited about displaying the launch like this? Can you at least address that part? Oh, it's it's, it's great. I mean, to, to be able to, to get in there and, and experience that 360 degree view, um, you know, combining it with the, uh, you know, the Oculus Rift uh, goggles and things like that, it's uh, it really gives you a new perspective that we've never been able to do before. We've only been able to do that the last couple of years. All right, right, right back here on the end. Uh, Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight. Um, in terms of um, the delay when, when Cygnus stayed atop the Atlas, was there anything you had to do to accommodate any of the payloads in there or any of the late stow items? No, we didn't have to make any changes. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, but we worked closely with NASA to make sure everything was uh, going to be good to go uh, all the way through April. Uh, they did some additional analysis, and, and um, so we didn't have to repack or, or restow anything. So it, it's still the same payloads, and they're all in good shape. They've been powered since we loaded them. Um, and for Tara, in terms of the heat shield test you monitor or you mentioned for reentry, is that live telemetry downlink, or is anything planned to be recovered from that? That is a good question. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, I'll have to check on that and get back with you if you don't mind. Stick around afterwards. Okay, let's come up here. Ken Kramer, I think, uh, had a question. Thank you. Um, Ken Kramer, Universe Today, Northeast Astronomy Forum. For uh, Frank and, and Tara. Frank, first, could you, could you talk a little bit more about the personal meaning of John Glenn to you, okay, for this mission? And a lot of that work, Tara, was related to um, his work on the shuttle, uh, the aging process. You discussed it a little bit. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more whether this, uh, um, amplify more on the aging process experiments you have perhaps on this flight. Thank you. Well, my first exposure to John Glenn was when I was in, um, I won't tell you what grade, uh, but uh, our principal let us go across the street to Henry's house to watch the, uh, the launch of, of John Glenn on uh, Freedom 7 in uh, February of 1962. Very exciting day for me, and uh, I remember thinking that would really be a lot of fun. I'd love to be a part of that. And uh, so that was my earliest inspiration of actually thinking maybe someone in this country could grow up to be an astronaut, because I knew we were going to go further and faster, and we did. Um, I've followed John Glenn's career, of course, over the years. Um, met him several times. I was very excited when he came back to Johnson Space Center to train for his mission on the, on the space shuttle. Um, and uh, he was fantastic to work with then. Um, he and his family were, were great to have around, and, and I've seen him many times since he flew. Uh, I'm, I'm sad that he's gone, but he's lived a really full life, and he's provided inspiration to a couple of generations of, uh, of American men and women. Uh, and I also want to point out that uh, he's still older than I am now when he went back on the shuttle, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> That's... Wow. Yeah. So thanks for asking. Um, so interestingly, with regard to aging, our astronaut population seems to, to represent kind of an accelerated model of aging, so to speak. That's how we kind of internally refer to it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're doing okay, though. So you're, you're, I think you're aging backwards. I was yeah, that's say it. that yeah, earlier. That's I was going to comment on that. Mentally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, with regard to uh, this particular investigation that I mentioned earlier, um, this is going to be uh, sending up a, a, a synthetic telomere set solution. And so the telomeres are at you know the end caps of your chromosome. And with every cell division as we get older, our, constantly, our cells are constantly dividing. Uh, those get shorter. Those telomere lengths get shorter. So uh, it's associated with aging. It's part of just who we are and how we age. Uh, it's associated with health, uh, some cardiovascular diseases and, and such. Uh, when things go strange. Um, and so uh, this particular set is really just going to send up synthetic telomeres and look at how they heat them up on orbit, uh, get the samples home, and just make sure the technology and the system is amplifying the DNA associated with those. So that it, first step in, in then us being able to take that further and study that molecular process of aging or stress or, or radiation effects and how, what it might mean to our astronauts' health. And, it, and of course, uh, it'll tell us something about our own aging process, too. 
Um, and the larger picture um, with the, our astronauts and, and the aging process, we look at things like um, impacts on the immune system. Uh, some of the immune system is showing uh, similarities to uh, what we see in our aging population on Earth. So we develop studies that look at uh, different sets of uh, behavior in the immune system uh, so that we can keep our crew healthy, but also bring that information back to us on Earth. Uh, the bones are the big ones. I think most everybody can relate to that. As we get older, our bones tend to get weaker. And, you know, we, we see things like osteoporosis. In our astronaut population, um, just they, if, if they did no exercise and no countermeasures, no protection for bones as it is, um, they would lose bone mass, uh, mo bone uh, mass at a rate of about 1% to 2% per month, which is more than that of a postmenopausal woman. Um, and so uh, we have learned over the past few years now how to combat the bone mineral uh, loss and maintain density. We do know that there's still bone turnover in space, and that's normal for all of us. But as and even as we age, our bone will break down and, and re rebuild, and it keeps our bones and our bones strong. Um, but we have learned that if the crew keeps up their resistive exercise, their um, kind of weightlifting, so to speak, on orbit, and they take all the vitamin D, big doses that we give them, and eat all their calories, they're able to maintain bone mineral density, which is interesting, and it's a first. Now, we don't know yet about the structure of that bone because it's constantly rebuilding, but those are the next steps in research. And that's an example of information that you can take back to Earth and reiterate to the aging population here is keep up your resistive exercise, eat the calories, eat nutrition, take your vitamin D. As you talk to your doctors, some of you may have heard this before. Um, we also um, think about, uh, when I go back to the telomere study, you know, telomeres, um, I, I mentioned they shorten. Interestingly, uh, the twin study that was done uh, when Mark Kelly, uh, when the Kelly brothers, uh, Kelly was in space, Scott was in space, and uh, Mark Kelly was compared on the ground, they looked at the telomeres um, uh, for both of them, and interestingly and strangely enough, preliminarily, it looked like Scott's telomeres, telomeres were actually lengthening, which is completely unexpected. And again, it's still preliminary, and the researchers are kind of scratching their heads at that. Um, uh, and so as soon as he stabilized on Earth for a little bit longer, the telomeres returned to where we would expect. So uh, again, uh, lots of interesting things happening at the molecular level. Aging-wise, there's a whole lot going on inside the bodies of the astronauts that we take advantage of working with the scientists to make sure that we gain information, gain insight into what's really going on so we can make sure that the public benefits here on Earth as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question right here. Rick Lansby with WFIT. I guess this is a question for Tara regarding the CubeSats. Are they deployed from the space station or from the Cygnus? Uh, good question. So I think, uh, let's see, all but, so 34 will be deployed from the Kibo airlock on space station, and the other four will be deployed from Cygnus as Cygnus leaves and it'll enter a higher altitude of about 500 kilometers, and those four will be deployed um, there. And we have a question up front here on the other side of the room. Uh, Jim Siegel, I'm with the Celebration Independent and with uh, Space Flight Insider. I have a question for Tara uh, about the advanced plant habitat experiments. Uh, I asked you about this a couple of uh, times ago. Um, I'm interested in what, what is unique or different about the habitat that, that is going up now. Will the astronauts consume some of the plants that are going to be grown? And do some of the plants come back to Earth for further study, or how does that work? Okay, so the unique parts about the advanced plant habitat is it will be the largest production facility for plants ever on the space station. So it's gonna be able to grow larger plants and, and larger plants lead to uh, things like um, food production uh, kind of crops. Initially, uh, this will be used for science because we wanna evaluate the efficacy of the hardware. So um, uh, let's see, APH, the Advanced Plant Habitat, can control different lighting conditions. It can control uh, relative humidity, temperature, uh, carbon dioxide exchange, um, let's see, and lots of other things I'm sure that the scientists know at a very detailed level. Uh, the watering system is controllable, and that's really important. And again, being able to grow large crops. Now, initially with the wheat and the Arabidopsis, we were gonna, we were gonna look at them from a scientific standpoint. We'll wanna return the samples uh, so that we can study them and make sure that there's nothing um, interestingly different going on there with that habitat, making sure it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. And then, um, I, and then the first science that's gonna happen in November, 
that's been awarded will be, again, a scientific study, I believe, using Arab Arabidopsis, which is a model organism. And eventually, as we uh, learn to um, understand how this habitat functions, I imagine we will evolve into uh, crops. I don't know, and, and kind of edible foods. I don't know what the schedule is for this yet, though, and, and so I'm not quite sure when the crew is going to be allowed to sample them. Uh, I know when we went through the veggie system, the hardware system, uh, the crew was not allowed to sample the first crop. It was supposed to return home, and it did, so that we can ensure, you know, there's microbial communities that are part of plants and could be affected by microgravity, the nutrition levels. Scientists want to figure all that out before we let the we just let the crew eat it. So I, so I imagine it's going to be a little bit of an evolution uh, on this hardware before. But I know when the crew eats it, it's going to be big news, because it always is. Uh, lots of photos. No free range astronauts. <laughs> nah, I mean, and no GMO, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right, we have a follow up question right here left. Um, Chris Gephardt with NASA Space Flight again uh, for Joel and I think maybe Frank too. Um, the first question is I think there was an EVA earlier this month that had to be delayed because there's a component on Cygnus that was needed for it. So I'm wondering what the preliminary timeline is for that EVA, assuming a no nominal berthing this weekend. And um, how much additional up mass were you able to get on OA7 by switching it to the Atlas V? So let's see, on the first uh, question, it was the express powered controller assembly that was in this vehicle. And so we're gonna, right now we're targeting May 12th for the next EVA with uh, Jack Fisher and Peggy Whitson going outside. Um, this was you know, an, a risk that we had d discussed when we were planning the, the triple EVAs from a, uh, a crew standpoint, not not really an issue. Uh, we'll just wait for the, the OA7 hardware, give the crew some time to get on board, get the new Soyuz crew on board. And, uh, but right now we're targeting for May 12th. And I'm sure Peggy's really complaining about that. Yes. <laughs> the extra time. But uh, in terms of uh, additional up mass on this one, we added about 300 kilograms to what we had originally been planning. On, on this one, and we're continuing to increase our up mass that we can carry on both Antares and Atlas going forward so that we can keep up with the demand on the station. I also want to say I really appreciate all of you being here. Um, being able to continue to show what we're doing in space is really important, and you all make it happen. And I really appreciate the fact that you're asking questions about what they're doing in space and not just how we're getting there and getting back, because that's what really, really counts. And I also appreciate Dr. Rutley being here to answer all those questions. So <laughs> thanks, Tara. Marsha, a follow-up? Yes, Marsha Dunn, AP. Uh, probably for you, Frank. Um, besides the banner with John Glenn's uh, portrait, um, do you have any other Glenn things going up that might you know, um, pay tribute to him? Uh, we have some some memorabilia for his family, and uh, uh, as as we normally do. And I do want to say that uh, I really uh, Annie Glenn is is an amazing person, very gracious, very strong, and I really appreciate her giving us permission to use John's um, name on this this mission. It w it meant a lot to us to be able to do that. Our team was very honored to be able to do that. By chance, are any family members coming for the launch? Uh, with the delay, I don't believe any of them were able to come, unfortunately. They're always welcome, though. We'll get them a ticket somehow. Bill. Bill Howard again for Joel this time. Uh, can you give us an update on when you think uh, CRS-11 uh, might be going for SpaceX uh, ballpark? Uh, right now, late May. So uh, we're looking at a May 31st launch and a berthing on uh, June 3rd. All right. James. Uh, James Dean, Florida Today. Uh, for either Frank or Joel, perhaps. I just wondered if you could remind us why Atlas is the right vehicle for this mission or, or what the, the for, for any of that, that you will choose Atlas for, why, why you do that. And moving, uh, looking ahead through CRS-2, do you think we can expect to see uh, roughly the similar breakdown between the vehicles or, or no idea yet? For this one, uh, because there was a slightly increased demand for cargo to the station sooner rather than later, and uh, Atlas had a, a, a vehicle available and additional up mass available. Um, we talked to NASA and decided jointly to go ahead with the Atlas in early spring for this one. Uh, Antares is being readied right now uh, for another launch at Wallops. Uh, it could go as early as this summer, depending on NASA's demand. And we, as I said, are continuing to increase the up mass capability on that. So we can go either way, depending on uh, what the pace of the 
of the uh, cargo resupply demand is and uh, and the availability of vehicles um, we we are comfortable going either way and Tari's of course is is uh, an orbital ATK vehicle so we like flying on that but we certainly appreciate the partnership with ULA on CRS2 uh, NASA hasn't actually told us exactly which missions they'll want on which vehicles and that's part of the contract proposal we made to them and so we're waiting to see which way they'd like for us to to go whether it's a mix or or uh, all one or the other and we hope to hear that pretty soon right joel yes and and, and i'll just add you know having the opportunity to launch on different vehicles uh, keeps our program robust i mean that's um the ability to keep space station utilized keep our crews busy keep the science coming keep the research coming that having the multiple launch opportunities and the more multiple launch rockets uh enhances that capability so it's something we we like seeing all the time ken you had a follow-up um for joel also and maybe for the others um peggy whitson's missions has been extended i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and is there any cargo for her <coughs> uh, science or otherwise that's going up thanks okay so um you know when as you're well aware, the, the Russians had the progress anomaly late last year. When they sorted out and, and recovered from the anomaly and you laid out all the missions, there was going to be a, a, a two-month gap this summer. That's uh, partly due, well, when the Russians also, they went to two Russian crew members from three to two Russian crew members starting with this upcoming Soyuz. So we worked with our Russian colleagues to look at um, having the extension of one of the USOS crew members. Um, talking, you know, the benefits of the increased research in science, the fact that uh, gives maintains EVA capability on the U.S. segment, maintains our ability to capture and uh, unberth vehicles. It was a, just a win-win across the board. Uh, Peggy also has well respected by the Russian community, has a lot of experience, is another set of hands for them, and working with our Russian colleagues, we were able to extend her to September. So uh, we're excited. And, uh, you can't imagine how excited she is. I think the conversation, although I went there, I'm sure when she, they didn't get the words out of their mouth talking about the extension and Peggy was, I'm ready to go. Over the moon. <laughs> <laughs> James, it looks like you had one more. He's just, you know, follow up. You're not. All right. Any further questions? All right. In that event, uh, just one programming note for uh, tomorrow. Our post-launch news conference is now going to be scheduled for 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And then uh, our launch coverage tomorrow starts at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern. And uh, you can also watch that online by going to www.nasa.gov slash NTV. And that will conclude our press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, George. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.